Feedman to this uh, lecture organized by the Arab Center, which has become a very important place for a long time, where a lot of brainstorming and discussion goes on. We are very happy that uh, the, at the time we are here and the time we spend for discussion, um, discussing issues which are a matter of interest for us. I'll be speaking in Arabic because the event is organized by the Arab Center. Mahran will be speaking in English. We have simultaneous interpretation. This morning, we are happy to discuss a topic which has been widely discussed at the political, intellectual, academic levels, or at the level of policies, too, and this pertains to Iran and the role of Iran in the region, which has made the Iranian issue of great importance at all levels of discussion. Today in particular, we will be discussing a very pertinent uh, issue or question which relates to the state resilience in Iran and to what extent is this state, Iran state, as resilient, as strong, it's coherent since in the Islamic Revolution of 1979 until now, we have noticed that the state in Iran has faced uh, many issues, pressures, uh, from the outside or at the internal level, whether to do with the Iran-Iraq war or the American sanctions imposed on Iran, or even at the level of the internal pressures. There were three mini-revolutions in the last decade or so, and we noticed that the state which appeared very strong throughout these issues. The secret behind that will be revealed by Mehran Kamrava, the very expert amongst us who is qualified to answer this question. He will answer the question why the state is considered to be resilient. Mehran Kamrava is professor of government at Georgetown University, Qatar, and he directs the Iranian Studies Unit at the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. Kamrava is the series editor for the Contemporary Issues in the Middle East series of Syracuse University Press and the Iran from Pahlavis to the present series at Hearst Publishers and Oxford University Press. He's the author of a number of journal articles and books, including most recently Righteous Politics, Power and Resilience in Iran, a number of books. In fact, we need a seminar to discuss. We, Kamran will speak for Mamam speak for 30 minutes. Shukran jazeel and laka Ibrahim. Thank you all being here, Ramadan Karim. I apologize for not speaking in Arabic. Um, uh, my Arabic isn't good enough to, uh, to give this talk uh, in Arabic, and I apologize for that. Um, I wanted to uh, say a couple of things about the reasons for the resilience of the Iranian state. Uh, one of the questions that has always um, puzzled me is how is this state still standing despite everything, despite itself, 
despite self-inflicted wounds, and despite the fact that it, uh, the, the world's preeminent superpower, the United States, is so determined to ensure that it uh, is under maximum pressure. You remember that maximum pressure was Donald Trump's policy, and the policy hasn't changed under Joe Biden. It is not called maximum pressure anymore, but the substance of the policy remains. So one of the questions in my mind that I would like to kind of walk through with you is how is the state still standing despite everything? And to do so, first I want to unpack that question of uh, the kinds of pressures on the Iranian state and then look at reasons for state resilience and then uh, by looking at state resilience we need to have a much better understanding of the institutional makeup of the Iranian state. So if you look at Iran we see that the state is under three distinct but interrelated kinds of pressure. Those are pressures from within the system, systematic pressures that have to do with the structure and makeup of the Iranian state. Second set of pressures come from the outside, maximum pressure, sanctions, all the things that Iran is under, uh, all the uh, international kinds of pressure that Iran is under. And the third is pressure from within, from Iranian society. As uh, we know, Iran has undergone these uh, repeated uh, protests, repeated uprisings, the latest one, uh, um, women, life, freedom uh, that was um, uh, triggered by the killing of, a, of an Iranian teenager really shook the state to its core. And many of us who study Iran thought this was it. The Islamic Republic was about to collapse. And then we realized that no, there are internal mechanisms that uh, the state, uh, state uh, makes the state survive. You might know that we have just entered the Iranian New Year. And although we haven't seen protests, one of the really interesting uh, phenomena that we've been witnessing in Iran are various kinds of very creative acts of civil disobedience. For example, a lot of Iranians are celebrating Nowruz despite the fact that the state has told them it's Ramadan. Today actually happens to be the uh, anniversary, anniversary of the, the death, death of, of Imam Ali, Ali. The, the state, state has told them, do not today. You are not allowed to celebrate. And uh, I've already talked to two different people in Tehran today. And they were on their way to a major picnic and kind of uh, making sure that they celebrate really heartily as uh, ways of defying the state. So why is that the state, how are the, why is the state um, still surviving? Uh, let me just also, uh, before I talk about reasons for state survival, say that the Islamic Republic and its institutions have evolved in a way that they were not always planned. And there have been institutional appendages that have been added to the state for example, the Expediency Council and uh, um, the, National, uh, the Supreme National Security Council, all of these have been added in ways that were not originally constitutionally envisioned. And if the fact that they've been added doesn't mean that they always work in concert with one another. In fact, oftentimes, what we see is that the Iranian state is dysfunctional. It actually undermines itself from within. There are various um, forms in which the state doesn't act as a cohesive uh, whole, as a cohesive uh, unitary whole, and that undermines its efficacy. It results in a number of systematic strengths. Yeah, sorry, systematic stresses. So what are the sources of strength? Why is this state still standing? First of all, I think we need to start with the re realization that this is a highly ideological state. It is an Islamic Republic 
in more than just name. It has a deep sense of ideological orientation. And as such, it has the ideological, uh, it enjoys ideological legitimacy among a significant number of Iranians. It's very difficult to determine exactly what percentage of Iranians perceive the system to be legitimate, but historically, Iranian elections have registered around 60 to 70 percent of the electorate. The presidential elections have been uh, in the higher 60s in their, at their lowest, or all the way up to uh, 76, 77 percentages. And historically, parliamentary elections have been also around 60 percent. The election, the presidential election of 2021 was 41 percent, and then the parliamentary elections a couple of weeks ago were at 41, 42 percent, um, and uh, that's the lowest that uh, the government has gone, 41, 42 percent. We might be at the precipice of change. I'll talk about that with Raisi's election. But, but it is fair to say that there's a significant percentage of Iranians that view the state as legitimate. And conventionally, we've put that percentage at anywhere between 15 to 20 percent of people who are ideologically motivated. 15 to 20 percent of Iranians who view the state as ideologically, Islamically legitimate, and therefore they are actively supporting the state. There's also been that 40 percent electoral legitimacy. And even if we say, well, the state fudges the numbers and exaggerates the numbers, reduce it to 30 percent, that's still a significant uh, percentage. Of the remaining 70 to 80 percent of Iranians who don't view the state as legitimate, an overwhelming majority of them are simply quiet. They're not necessarily active in protesting. They're not active in um, uh, uh, engaging in acts of uh, disobedience or in trying to actively undermine or overthrow the state. So we know that in authoritarian systems, the majority of the population simply exits from the political process. There's a apathy that is a result of the high cost of political activism, that result. So most of the people just don't want to bother with politics. A very few isolated people here and there protest um, when things become extremely difficult. But by and large, uh, either the people are apathetic and don't want to have anything to do with politics, or they that 15 to 20 percent actively support the state. So the first thing that we need to keep in mind is that there is deep ideological belief by about 15 to 20 percent of the population. And those are the masses of people that come out in the streets and, and you see them, for example, during the uh, um, uh, funeral of Qasem Soleimani, uh, in which just during the funeral of Qasem Soleimani, 50 people, 52 people apparently uh, died uh, uh, during the rush of, uh, rush of people. But a bigger source of legitimacy is the institutional, a uh, bigger source of strength, rather, is the institutional makeup of uh, the state. The institutional makeup of the state that has a number of distinct features. First of all, there are elections in Iran. And we know that authoritarian elections serve specific functions. There are three functions that elections in Iran uh, serve that I want to highlight. First and foremost, they are safety valve. They give the regime an appearance of democracy. They make the system 
um, allow people to let off some steam. And even people who don't believe in the ideological legitimacy of the system often vote due to the fact that they view this as their civic duty. There have been interesting uh, public opinion polls in Iran, something around 40 to 50 percent of Iranians who are not uh, who don't buy into the uh, ideology of the Velayat Fari, the Supreme Jurist Council. 40 to 50 percent of Iranians uh, view it as their civic duty to vote. And so take part in elections, not because of the Islamic Republic per se, but because of Iran. And they make that distinction in terms of the importance of what to do for the safety of the country rather than for the Islamic Republic. Now, authoritarian elections also enable authoritarian leaders to get a sense of how the public feels. And the fact that over the last two elections, in the presidential election and then the parliamentary election, presidential election of 2021 and parliamentary election of 2024, given the fact that people that fewer people are voting, that enables the state to get a better sense of public dissatisfaction. And so it's really interesting that every time right before elections, political space opens up, uh, suddenly there are new and exciting candidates. On this election, the last parliamentary election, there, were even, there was even pop music as part of campaign for some of the uh, uh, candidates, which was kind of unusual. And what, what all of this does is to enable authoritarian leaders to kind of get a sense of what the public is feeling. And I think what we're likely to see for the next presidential campaign that comes up next year, we might see actually a couple of uh, exciting candidates, that the um, uh, Guardian Council won't necessarily be as restrictive just to increase uh, level of public excitement and level of public participation in the political process. And of course, uh, uh, authoritarian elections are a wonderful way for elite recruitment. If you want to uh, become part of the political elite, part of the narrow political circle, you kind of go through the electoral process. If you get vetted, if you're successful through the vetting process, and if you play your cards right, you, uh, 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 the, um, uh, you become part of the political elite, or at least start somewhere. This is important because in 2019, mm -hmm. Khamenei embarked on what he called the second phase of the revolution in 2019. And as part of the second phase of the revolution, Khamenei has tried to revamp the personnel of the state post for the post-Khamenei era. So what he has been doing is that uh, Friday prayer imams and Khamenei's representatives are his new protégés uh, to kind of ensure that the Islamic Republic continues to have the ideological flavor of Khamenism post Khamenei in the post Khamenei era after he passes away. Khamenei is 85 years old, and even supreme leaders have a finite lifespan. Even the supreme leader is going to um, uh, depart from the scene. Now, apart from elections, I think it's important to say, to remember that this is a highly authoritarian state. And when push comes to shove, the state will not uh, hesitate to resort at all sorts of coercive measures. It has, in fact, two very violent Praetorian arms. One is the Revolutionary Guards, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, and the other is a subcomponent of the IRGC or the Basij. The Basij are supposed to be 20 million of them. Uh, the IRGC is much more, um, uh, is uh, much smaller, but it is nonetheless just as ideologically dedicated to preserving the system. You know that the 
IRGC has emerged into a massive economic behemoth. It's like an octopus that has its arms into multiple arenas of the Iranian political system as well as Iranian economy, but it is the crack, it is the guardian of the revolution. And as the guardian of the revolution, it is the ideological protector of the Islamic Republic. In many ways, the IRGC and the Basij really need to be seen as the Praetorian guards of the Islamic Republic, Praetorian guards of, of Khamenei. In addition to Praetorian guards, the state also has a number of internal mechanisms and internal institutions for maintaining itself, for ensuring that the system operates the way it should, ideologically, politically, institutionally, and in terms of personnel. There are three particular institutions that are inside the Islamic Republic whose function is specifically to make sure that the, same, the system operates the way it should. First and foremost, the Guardian Council. And the Guardian Council uh, has 12 members. It is meant to be something of an upper house of parliament. It is theoretically, in the Constitution, meant to act as an institution that makes sure that the policies of the uh, National Assembly meet the criteria of Islam. But in practice, it's become a system, the, an institution, to vet candidates for elected office. So every candidate for almost every elected office has to register and then they go through this vetting process in the Guardian Council. Guardian Council, as I said, has 12 members. Six of them are, uh, are uh, lawyers appointed by the Iranian parliament. Six of them are clerics appointed by Khamenei. And those six clerics have the upper hand within the Guardian Council. And what the Guardian Council does is that it vets all these candidates. So imagine for parliamentary elections, thousands of candidates uh, sign up and uh, the numbers are available. What the Guardian Council does is routinely get rid of 70, 80 percent of these people who have signed up to run for office. And only those who are uh, ideologically committed and who have been uh, uh, who have met certain religious criteria or moral and ethical criteria or have the right connections, only those people are approved uh, to run. So the first institution that is meant to maintain the system from within is the Guardian Council. A second institution is an institution that has uh, that is called the Expediency Council. This was a kind of a um, stroke of genius that Khomeini had um, uh, talking about expediency. It was a jurisprudential innovation that Khomeini introduced to Shiism, having borrowed it from Sunnism, the whole notion of maslahat, expediency. And then he gave it an institutional forum. He, put together an assembly, and uh, this assembly, <coughs> the, um, uh, the Expediency Council, is supposed to figure out what is in the maslahat, in the expediency, in the interest of the system that trumps Islam, that outweighs Islam. So if there are, for example, do you engage in warfare on uh, Friday, or do you, uh, is it permissible to damage the environment during warfare? All of these questions, can you, uh, can you destroy a mosque 
because a road needs to run through it. So all these questions that um, uh, when a, a Islamic jurisprudence comes into conflict with the interest and the, um, the uh, maslahat of the state, uh, this council is meant to uh, look into. And of course, the third institution is the judiciary. And the judiciary, again, is uh, not uh, is meant not just to adjudicate social conflicts, but to ensure that the state's authoritarian conformist laws, in terms of uh, political conformity as well as moral conformity, uh, particularly in relation to women, are are observed. So there are um, these institutions meant to ensure that the system runs the way it is supposed to. There's also, and I use this term with some reluctance, but there's also a deep state. It's a set of institutions that we don't always think about, but they are extremely powerful, and they play incredibly influential roles in maintaining the system the Islamic Republic system. Some of these might surprise you, some of them may not necessarily surprise you. First of all, there are the plethora of intelligence agencies that Iran had, has. At last count, Iran had 18 different intelligence agencies. So uh, one of the mildest ones is the Ministry of Intelligence. and. Um, one of the not so pleasant ones is the IRGC intelligence. So you imagine there are 18 of these different agencies and uh, various presidents at different times have tried to create greater synergies, they've tried to merge some, uh, they've said we've got way too many, sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, and uh, one of those presidents was Ahmadinejad. He didn't succeed. Rouhani also tried, and he uh, didn't succeed. And so um, that's why there are, despite these 18 intelligence agencies, that's why Iran has had some very famous intelligence failures in the form of assassination of some of its nuclear uh, scientists. So you can imagine that bureaucratic politics has come in the way of um, uh, 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 efficiency and uh, effectiveness. In addition to intelligence agencies, there's the qom based clerical establishment. I tried to find out how many clerics or men of cloth Iran has, and I discovered this is a highly securitized question. Nobody was willing to answer. Some people say, well, there are about uh, 20,000. Some people say 50,000. Uh, nobody quite knows how deep the, uh, or how expansive the clerical establishment is. We do know that the clerical establishment is not united and that some of the biggest challenges to the uh, uh, to interpretations, to the orthodoxy, orthodox interpretations of Khamenei and company have come from within the clerical establishment. Nonetheless, what's important to remember is that Khamenei, not so much Khomeini, but Khamenei has increasingly bureaucratized a clerical establishment that historically was famous for its diffuse organization and lack of organization. Khamenei has highly bureaucratized the Qom um, establishment. And if you go to Qom, one of the uh, first things that uh, you see, or although you're not supposed to see them, are plainclothes security officers. Uh, kind of uh, not, not only is it highly bureaucratized, it's also highly securitized. And so the, um, I think it's fair to say that the clerical establishment has lost its autonomy in terms of being able to produce uh, 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 independent knowledge. Pr uh, it's, it's lost its intellectual autonomy and freedom. It is now highly bureaucratized. There's even all the um, publishing venues, the journals, the uh, publishers, 
are controlled by the state or if not controlled by the state, they are in close coordination, they work in close coordination and collaboration with the state. And so for clergy based in the city of Guam, it's become highly difficult to engage in independent, autonomous intellectual production. Many of them are supporters of the state. For those who are not, for the clergy who are non-conformist, there's another arm of the deep state, and that is called the special court for the clergy. The, uh, the special court for the clergy uh, is not a court. It is uh, made up of one or two uh, uh, clerics uh, that are highly committed to Khamenei's jurisprudence, and if a cleric publishes anything or delivers a lecture that is against the official orthodoxy, he is brought up before the special court for the clergy, and the special for, for the, uh, uh, court for the clergy uh, kind of uh, passes judgment. There have been numerous uh, defrockings with uh, clergy who've been told uh, that they cannot wear the clerical garb anymore. And it's not as simple as just uh, exchanging your garb. It takes away their identity. That's what they've studied for. That's how they identify themselves. But it's taken away their identity. And then the last kind of uh, source of the deep state is the radio and television broadcasting. Uh, it's a massive institution uh, uh, across Iran that has about 30,000 employees. It is meant to kind of um, function as the official propaganda arm of the state, and it deals with that 20% that is highly ideologically committed. So although most people get their news from alternative sources, from satellite TV or from others, it, um, it uses uh, the, uh, the uh, Iran radio um, um, uh, broadcasting network is the uh, official arm of the state. There's also intra-elite dynamics. These intra-elite dynamics, um, you know that Iran is famous for its factionalism, given that we have this massive state that is not unitary, has multiple uh, institutions. Each of these factions use uh, part of the institution of the state for its own purposes. Broadly, we can talk about three factions. The conservatives who want to conserve and preserve the principles of the revolution. Lately, they've been known as the so-called principalists. We don't call them conservative anymore. They're principalists. Uh, then there are kind of uh, people at the other end of the pole, those who want to reform the legacy of Khomeini, and they, they're known as reformists, and then the moderates. The principalists are Raisi, the moderates are Rouhani, the reformists are uh, Khatami, former President Khatami. And the reformists have become a relic of the past. They've become, uh, they're now, irrelevant, they're, they're not, a, they're spent force, they're not a political force in Iran anymore, largely because of exclusion by the state, partly because of their own doing, their own inability to come up with a cohesive framework uh, in the Q&A, I can talk about it, but, but the fact that there's been this elite give and take, at least between moderates and principalists, is itself a source of strength. The fact that there's been some kind of give and take, uh, and there are right now uh, in, a, uh, in the Iranian parliament that has 270 members, there's something like four reformists. So they're completely done, but they're not a fair number, about 10 to 12 um, so-called moderates or independents, but that in itself is a source of strength. Lastly, what we don't think of the Iranian state, uh, and a major source of strength, is that the fact is the fact that the Iranian state is itself a major source of wealth. 
and riches for a significant population, uh, segment of the Iranian population through clientelism and through rent-seeking behavior. The state is the primary contractor. It gives out contracts. And according to Forbes, in 2022, Iran, Forbes magazine, Iran had the highest percentage of millionaires in the Middle East, which I kind of find hard to believe living here in Qatar, but that is a, a statistic that Forbes came, up, uh, came out with. And there is a number of people who become incredibly, inordinately wealthy thanks to the state. How does this work? If you work at the, uh, if you're a Revolutionary Guards um, commander or if you've had some sort of connection, you retire, you open a business, you use your um, connections to get state contracts, and you become incredibly wealthy. So uh, uh, former members of parliament, uh, are now industrialists, and they form the primary uh, industrialist class in Iran, former members of the Revolutionary Guards, people with uh, bureaucrats, with uh, connections. And of course, there's been, since the 1990s, there's been a massive wave of um, privatizations in Iran, state privatization. And these privatizations have opened up space for people with connections to uh, buy stuff up, um, uh, buy up state assets. So Iran is a resilient state. Let me end with kind of uh, reminding us that Iran is at the gates of historic change. Uh, uh, and I know this is often said that, you know, we're looking at major changes, but Khamenei is 85 years old. And although he is in, he seems to be in much better health than his younger American counterpart, Joe Biden, and he seems to be much more spry and much more alert, nonetheless, uh, he is 84, uh, 85 years old. And uh, what happens, we don't know. My sense is that given everything that we have just been talking about, Iran and the Islamic Republic will far outlast Khamenei, the Revolutionary Guards, the Deep State, the Praetorians, everybody will kick in and it'll be business as usual, much to the dismay of the uh, opposition, I Iranian opposition that wants to overthrow the Islamic Republic. Thank you very much for your indulgence. Thank you. Thank you. Shukran Thank you very much, Mahran, for this very informative presentation. And thank you again. Personally, I learned a lot from your presentation, and I learned. Uh, uh, that the supreme leader will be leaving the scene similarly to anybody else, and he is in a better health uh, than his counterpart in the U.S. But I want to, I want to take advantage of uh, the time element, but I'll please allow me two quick questions. First of all, why is the number of clerics so confidential and secret that nobody knows the exact figure. What's the idea behind this? Why is it so secret? My second question, the role of ideology, I agree with. When it comes to state resilience, especially when the role of ideology is accompanied by state brutality in the security apparatus and the like. But the communist regimes had a strong ideology and they had state brutality, maybe even worse than Iran, but ultimately they collapsed. So what's the <laughs> difference in the role of ideology? Iranian 
regime when it comes to state resilience. Thank you. Then we'll take a round of questions from the audience. Uh, the role of the number of the clergy, um, why is it a state secret? I don't know. And um, I, uh, uh, I tried to find out why. And nobody would tell me. They were even afraid to tell me why it is. Uh, I think part of it is because um, there is a fear that the actual number of clerics has declined in, in Iran. Now, anecdotally, we know that or in. Maybe higher than what's expected. Or higher than what's expected. But, uh, but the state tries to control religion. And it cannot always control religion. But it tries in a variety of ways through controlling the hoses, the seminaries. Uh, all the seminaries are now kind of controlled by the state. But, and all the, uh, the, the curriculum is also dictated centrally uh, by the Ministry of Irshad and Islamic, uh, Islamic guidance, but uh, the curriculum of the seminaries. But what goes on in the classroom between the senior cleric and the seminary students, the tolab, is hard to control. So uh, the state doesn't know how to kind of, the state has pushed itself, its back into a corner by its attempt at controlling religion. So for example, all the mosques are closed except for uh, specific times. They used to be open 24-7 before the revolution. Now they're closed uh, except for prayer time and all the Friday prayer sermons are centrally dictated. There's a council on Friday prayer sermons uh, in Iran. So uh, you ask a really good question and I don't know, uh, I don't think the answer really we know. And then um, what's the difference between um, why did communist ideology kind of die and Islam continues in, in former Soviet Union and Islam continues to exist uh, or, or at least hold the imagination of some people? Um, first of all, let's remember communism died after something like 75 years. It's only been 45 years in Iran. <laughs> Right, so uh, give it another 30 years and uh, then we'll, continue the we'll continue the discussion. But there was also a very robust discussion in Iran about 15 to 10 years ago. Is Iran following the China model? So is Iran as Islamic as China is communist? And that was a big subject of debate among in, uh, within intellectual circles in Iran. And Khamenei came out specifically with a major speech and said the China model does not apply to Iran because uh, although th they, have, they might ab have abandoned communist ideology in economics, we're never going to abandon Islam. So the state is kind of aware of the kind of the possibility that religious belief might decline as, as a political uh, force. Thank you. That's very Welcome. interesting. OK, let's take uh, questions. Basel, follow. Thank you, Mahran. Thank you so much. I want to invite you to think comparatively, because if we compare, if we take the variables that you suggested that explain the resilience of the state or the strength of the state, I mean, a lot of them are in common with Arab states just before the uprisings. It seems to me the only outlier is ideology. So unless you want us to think in terms of degrees of institutional power and so on, but if you think of institutions, coercion, crony capitalism, they were all there. It seems to me the only outlier is ideology. The other thing is uh, all your variables are domestic. But I'm sure there is something to be said about the geopolitics and the role geopolitics plays or Iran's geopolitics plays in the resilience of the state. So I'd like to pick your brain on that, please. Uh, thank you. The only variable is not, uh, oh, sh sorry, should I answer one at a yeah, time? You can, or? You 
can answer this question, but we'll, uh, okay. there are many questions. We'll try to okay. make sure people. Okay, but thank you. Yes. It's elite cohesion uh, in Iran. Because what we have is a um, very centralized elite in Iran. And the IRGC and the regular military are firmly behind it. So what tipped the balance in a place like Tunisia and Egypt was defection of the civilian leadership by the military. And that defection is not something that is likely to happen. If it happens, I would be shocked. The reason is because the IRGC, Revolutionary Guards, is highly ideologically committed to Khamenism. And of course, there are other sources that have strengthened this alliance between the civilian leadership and the military leadership. But uh, that kind of IRGC abandoning uh, Khamenei or the clerical leadership, I don't see it in the cards. But maybe we might be surprised. Sorry. Okay, Hamid. Oh, uh, sorry, may I? It's, there was a second part. Okay. Geopolitics. Uh, that's, a, that's another uh, very good, uh, good point. Uh, geopolitics as a source of regime strength. Um, only during Raisi's period does, by its own standards, has Islamic Republic achieved some successes in two primary foreign policy and security policy objectives. One is its uh, look east policy with becoming a member of BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and selling drones and missiles to Russia and all that. And the other is the good neighborly relations with the rapprochement with Saudi Arabia and with trying to reduce tensions with Azerbaijan and sending missiles to Pakistan and getting missiles from Pakistan, getting hit by missiles, and then the next week uh, kissing cheeks and you know shaking and like nothing happened. So is, uh, uh, is geostrate are geostrategic factors a source of regime strength? I don't think so. I think they've had some successes uh, and some not, not great successes. They've had a number of setbacks. But ultimately, what the source of regime strength is ideology, it's elite cohesion, and the fact that the Praetorians are firmly uh, behind the uh, civilian leadership. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, uh, Maharan. Uh, you know, the one thing that about the, about the Iranian state is the prediction is every time this state is going to fail, it's going to be collapsed, it's going to be imploded. And we see that the country is cruising its ways and it's becoming a regional power that people can get to, get to deal with it. Uh, one part that I'm just more interested about it is about the policy analysis and the policy making in this type of a state, because Iran is a very populist state. Popularism is in, is in Iran. It is driven by, the, all the agendas is driven by the popularism and pro propagated by the ideology. So I just want to see what is the role of the expertise and, uh, and uh, you know, in policy making or in a policy analysis within this setting, because a lot of time we see there's a strong man in Iran, He's driving the agenda, and then there are managerial style of people that they just run after him. So what's the role of the expertise of the policy professions? Thank you. Dr. Tamer, go ahead. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Mahran, for this insightful uh, discussion. Uh, uh, I'll pick on Hamid's point as well. I'm, I'm, I come from the public policy domain as well. And for me, what, what I want to understand more is the public interest and the attitude of the state towards the public interest when it comes to the wide range of social public services uh, provided to the public. So what's happening there? Is there a success story in Iran against all the pressures? And we know the economic sanctions and the isolation also Iran is, is facing. So w what's really happening on this domain, on public interest and the advancement of public interest? And does the state or, or has it acquired more legitimacy through its success on, in providing 
social and public services. One other thing also, what would I like also uh, to pick your mind on is, is are, what, what are the most key internal threats to the regime now coming from inside? I mean, if you could uh, prioritize or list these ones to us so we understand from an internal perspective the threats. And the urban, last, and this is the last point, the urban versus rural divide in Iran, similar to Turkey. There has been an emerging literature describing a similar situation where the rural parts of Iran side with the regime or the government, and the urban are the core or the center of resistance. If you could just shed more light on it. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tamer, and also from uh, uh, our followers from the followers of the Arab Center online, uh, there are questions, so we have to give them a share. So there is this question from Nader Habibi saying, question for Professor Bukamrava. Various surveys have shown that the level of religiosity among ordinary Iranians has declined. Can the rise of secularism and reduction of respect for Islamic style pose a threat to the regime in the long run? Thank you along with the other questions. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. P uh, Professor Habibi, uh, Nader Habibi is a good friend and a good friend of uh, Arab Center also. So it's uh, thank you for uh, taking his questions. Thank you all for the, uh, uh, for the question. I'll uh, try and uh, answer them as best as uh, I can. You know, um, uh, you ask a really good question about uh, populism versus the role of the experts. And uh, I'll, I'll see if I can uh, answer both questions at the same time. Uh, there's a constant tension in all these kinds of systems between populist policies and uh, expert-driven policies, expert advice. And uh, there have been, there's a plan and budget organization that is extremely popular. They come up with five-year plans, and the term of the president is uh, four years. So this uh, kind of the uh, plan of the country, the development plan, and the economic plan of the country is deliberately meant to outlast the term of the president. And kind of uh, it, there, there are, th there's an internal, uh, mechanism whereby kind of experts are meant to be uh, uh, have the bigger say in terms of long-term uh, economic uh, plans. But then suddenly, for example, we have um, the exec ex executive coming and uh, encouraging a lot of uh, financial institutions that are that offer high interest at uh, short term. This happened during Ahmadinejad's uh, policy. He completely messed up, literally, I don't want to say ruined, but he completely uh, made the banking system uh, uh, dysfunctional, Ahmadinejad did. Because as a populist, he came and he encouraged people to invest in these uh, financial houses that were not necessarily banks, and a lot of them collapsed. They were basically Ponzi schemes, and a lot of them collapsed. This was one of these uh, populist, um, um, uh, populist uh, gimmicks uh, that he had. Um, in terms of um, success stories, uh, there is a couple of important points to keep in mind. There's a big uh, school of thought looking at the Iranian economy that calls the Iranian state a developmental state that says that if you look at the, the way that the Iranian economy has functioned, at the manufacturing sector, at how it has gotten around the sanctions, it is a developmental state. I don't buy that, but that is something to think about. I don't necessarily buy that argument. The success that the government has had is in delivering the original promises of the revolution in terms of bringing levels of uh, the base up. So for example, uh, uh, the, if, uh, the lower classes uh, in the, in, uh, in the early decades of the revolution, their living standards increased. They were given state handouts, and they continue 
to be given uh, state handouts. Um, the, uh, there's been massive electrification across the country. The number of paved roads, the mileage of paved roads uh, has increased uh, to unfathomable proportions that you wouldn't think about. Uh, availability of clean water, the availability of health care to the most remote villages uh, is something that um, didn't exist. And, and the state has had major successes. Now, uh, you can argue that, well, yeah, that's the base, but what about kind of competing with the likes of South Korea, it, it cannot do that. Uh, in, in that sense, the state hasn't had uh, successes. What are some of the key internal threats? Uh, I think the biggest internal threat uh, is ideological coming from the new generation or successive generation of clerics. Uh, the kind of the ideological purity that Khamenei has instilled on the system is bound to change when, uh, when Khamenei goes. And then the urban versus rural divide. What is actually interesting is if you look at election data in Iran, the provinces, provincial towns, and the more remote areas have voted for reformists. They have voted consistently for the non-establishment candidate, if there is one in Iran. Quite, quite interesting. Um, whereas Tehran, in Tehran, the vote has gone for the establishment candidate. Because Tehranis, by and large, stay out of the voting ballot. The ones who vote are the uh, diehard ideologically uh, committed. Now, uh, the question we had uh, from Professor Habibi is the uh, show of legitimacy. No doubt. Um, the, uh, and, and one uh, simple indication of the legitimacy of the system can be uh, measured somewhat by the public appearance of people. Women in Iran now walk in Tehran, particularly walk freely uh, without the head cover. Or if their um, uh, scarf falls, it takes them an hour to remember to put it back on their head. Uh, they put it, uh, they wear it while they're driving because facial recognition technology snaps a, pictures, a picture of them and then sends a SMS fine to them on their phones, uh, whoever uh, to whoever the car is registered to. So ironically, women drivers observe the hijab. Women pedestrians don't. Uh, and in public places, they don't, as a show of defiance against the state. Now, but that's kind of anecdotal. We can't quite measure that. And if you go by uh, election data, there is 40% of people who vote. Thank you. We'll take the last three questions, and I apologize for the other ones because there is uh, we have due to time constraints. One, two, three. Uh, Dr. Amal, Thank you, Madam. Um, I want to pick up on regards to from the uh, clientelism. So I want to pick up on your last point on clientelism and the number of the high number of businessmen and businesswomen associated with the regime. And you just also mentioned um, elite cohesion. So first, I'm guessing you consider uh, this group as part of the elite and part of, and also a factor in the elite cohesion. But my, my question pertains to the transfer, uh, to the wealth transfer at a larger scale we're witnessing uh, from Iran outside uh, of Iran, especially to countries where wealth is associated with citizenship. So my question here is, what does this mean when the business elite is actually transferring so much wealth outside of the country? And what does this mean in terms of loyalty to the regime, a uh, sense of security and confidence in what the regime is doing? And if there are any indications of, you know, uh, regime's consciousness of, of uh, that phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mahran. Always a pleasure. So uh, let me ask 
some of the questions but in, in, in institutional sort of really format. So the, 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 the logic of the besiege and the pastoran was to try to uh, offer avenues for social mobilization, for uh, upward really mobilization, and they accumulated over time really symbolic power from society. And what you're saying is that in your last really variable, the, the, the privatization has really created a, a, a what a comprador elite, uh, uh, a group that's really alien to the to the uh, 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 to the rationale of the republic. So, do we see institutional infighting, and how does it play itself out? Because there's obviously, as you mentioned, there's uh, an entrenched Khomeinism uh, within the RGC who. I would guess might not be interested in seeing that form of uh, privatization. So how does it play out? How do institutions fight? And the other really question, if you allow me, and, and, and that's somewhat really uh, um, uh, related to you know, geopolitics and to institutions. We have in the Gulf um, three very ambitious, very young leaders in Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, in the Emirates, at least. So we do expect some kind of stability, some form of really regional, uh, stable engagement, uh, expenditures. Is there an eye inside of the institutions on Iran on what's happening in the region? Is it by any chance influencing some of the dynamics of the thinking really of the way to go forward? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahran, for this uh, very informative uh, presentation. I, I want to, um, to hear from you on the, the criteria of um, retaliation uh, with regard to the way the, uh, Iran projects itself to the outside world. Uh, there's a huge gap between this image of prowess, of um, strength that uh, the, the Republic tries to to project in the region, especially after the collapse of, of Iraq. And, and the, the fact that when uh, Iran is challenged by, uh, especially Israel and, and the US, on its own soil, on its personal basis and assets, uh, it fails actually to, uh, to live up to the bombastic uh, rhetoric uh, against the West in general and Israel in particular. So, and, and in, in a few instances, instead of retaliation, retaliating against I Israel, it would retaliate against the neighboring countries, Saudi so Arabia and Emirates, um, targeting the oil assets, etc. So, don't you see that, in fact, uh, the, the, the state is not that, that strong, and its capacity to retaliate shows that? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mahran. Thank you. Uh, we need another hour and a half yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, uh, to uh, do this. Yeah, um, you know, let me see if I can answer some of these um, uh, together. Uh, you know, um, the wealth transfer outside of Iran uh, occurred much, much earlier. And right now, it's not so much wealth transfer that is the topic of discussion, although there is some of that, but not as much. But it's brain, the expulsion of brains. It's not just brain drain, or it's not Iranian intellectuals uh, being called to come, being encouraged to come. They're being encouraged to leave, or kind of life is made difficult for them uh, to leave. It's still, there's still a lot of wealth to be made. And I think for every, uh, Iranian who leaves, there's a bunch of Iranians who live outside but make money inside. And so there's still, you know, it's a very, uh, it's a complex economy, deep economy. There's lots of opportunities for wealth generation, and there's, uh, there's a lot of that. What does that say about, the, about loyalty to the regime? That's a good question. I think, um, uh, you know, as long as this, uh, it's uh, as long as the state is robust, as long as it continues to provide avenues of wealth, as long as, as long as there are sanctions, and it's the state that's the only 
game to play in terms of getting contracts and b building roads and building f factories and import and export, then uh, people are dependent on this state. And one of the best blessings that has happened for Khamenei and company and the IRGC are the sanctions. And uh, I don't see the sanctions being removed uh, any time in the near future. I, uh, and and I, there are vested entrenched interests in Iran that don't want them to be removed uh, because they are, they've been such a massive source of wealth, such a boon uh, for, these, uh, for these folks. Um, you know, um, in terms of um, uh, the Basij, one thing we need to know uh, from the very beginning, th uh, there were some people in the revolutionary coalition who supported the Mustazafan, the downtrodden, the by and large, however, the clerical establishment has been laissez-faire, has been pro-business, very much against land reform, dead set against um, a minimum wage, uh, and uh, from an economic perspective, uh, highly to the right. The, and, and this uh, group of clergy, these, uh, this, uh, the current has been dominant in Iran. And a lot of the reformists who are barred from political activity, they go into business and they deal with then with the state and they uh, kind of become uh, indirect uh, supporters uh, of the state. So the institutional infighting that existed was in the 1980s. By the time uh, the war ended and we had the post-war reconstruction that after the first decade was over, the first decade of the revolution, we kind of go to the, everybody becomes laissez-faire. And everybody is a capitalist uh, in the, that kind of imperative of state control, state ownership that is now a distinct minority in Iran. So for the Basij, to have upward economic mobility is something that's considered um, a merit within the Islamic Republic. Uh, th that's not something that they are, um, that they mind. In terms of are they aware of the Gulf? I th uh, or are they aware of these three young, visionary, ambitious leaders? That's a really good question. And um, I don't know. I think they have been so, uh, concerned uh, with um, their own internal debates between is it security policy that should be dominant or foreign policy, uh, which file belongs to IRGC, which file belongs to the foreign ministry, which, you know, th does the foreign ministry control the um, uh, policy with Saudi Arabia? Is it IRGC? Who does this? I think there have been such kind of bureaucratic tension within the system that they haven't had the time to kind of think about these longer term uh, competitive leaders uh, that, uh, that are here. Um, and then lastly, criteria for uh, retaliation. Is the state as strong as it seems despite its bombastic rhetoric? You know, um, after Qasem Soleimani was killed, everybody who was involved in his assassination somehow perished. We don't necessarily hear that, but every single person, somehow some plane went down in Afghanistan, and we find out it was the people who were responsible for Qasem Soleimani's assassination. And then after uh, this, uh, a very famous nuclear scientist was executed in, uh, in Iran, inside Iran. Uh, there was a major traffic accident in Israel in which a major general lost his life. Now, the Iranians didn't claim credit for it, but uh, Twitter sphere came out with all these um, uh, theories, conspiracies, some of them, but all these theories 
that this guy was involved in some of these assassinations in Iran. So I am not sure that the Iranians don't retaliate. I think they retaliate in their own way, in their own style, in, in ways that don't necessarily garner the uh, attention of CNN or, or others. But um, uh, is the state strong? They say we, uh, oh, and in Erbil, they killed four Mossad agents. Uh, so that attack in Erbil, um, everybody, you know, news came out that of the people who were killed, there were four Mossad agents. So I'm not sure that they don't retaliate. Maybe they don't necessarily do it with the bravado that we think, or uh, it's not as newsworthy, but I think in their own way, they do their sinister deed. On that note. <laughs> on that note. Thank you so much. Uh, Mahran, shukran iktir laylak ala al-hadha al For joining us for this wonderful discussion, and I hope that we come back after 35 years and uh, to see what happens. Will the ideology with outlast uh, the troubles? Uh, Thank you uh, all for attending for this discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. We'll continue the discussion.